My dearly beloved in Christ, this morning, on the first Sunday of Lent, I would like to briefly cover three topics. First, 40 days. Why is Lent 40 days in duration? Second, fasting and the value of fasting. And then third, from today's gospel, temptation. Our Lord permitting himself to be tempted by the devil, encouraging us to fight the good fight and to conquer temptations. But first of all, why is Lent 40 days? Well, of course, our Lord fasted for 40 days, as we read in the gospel. Well, why did he choose that number? It is a sacred number, and we find it often in Scripture, in the liturgy. We also have 40 days after Easter, from the resurrection to the ascension. But it is more often associated with punishment for sin, with penance, expiation of sin. For example, the great flood. We read in Genesis that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Again, the chosen people, when they were led out of Egypt by Moses and led to the promised land, on the borders of the promised land, they rebelled and were punished by God, being compelled to wander for 40 years in the desert before they could enter the promised land. And here we see our Lord today, before beginning his public life, entering into a rigid penance of fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. So Holy Mother Church looks upon this number as sacred. In fact, Lent used to begin on today, on the first Sunday, quadragesima, which means 40. But since we don't do penance on Sunday, and there are six weeks until Christmas, uh, until Easter, giving us thereby 36 days, Holy Mother Church added the previous four days beginning on Ash Wednesday. So we want to persevere during Lent in our penances and sacrifices for 40 days in imitation of our Lord who endured such a terrible fast for 40 days duration. Why is fasting usually the main penance for Lent? Holy Mother Church requires us to fast We see our Lord fasting, and we see down through the centuries Catholics fasting, doing that particular penance. In fact, one day the Pharisees approached our Lord, and they said, Why do your disciples not fast? John, meaning John the Baptist, fasted, and his disciples fasted, Why do your disciples not fast? And our Lord said, they cannot mourn and do penance and fast as long as the bridegroom is with them, referring to himself. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then in those days they will fast. And that is a prophecy, prediction, that his followers, after his ascension into heaven, would fast, and indeed we find that very often in the Acts of the Apostles, the early church, and down through the centuries, especially in the lives of the saints. Fasting is good for even the body as well as the soul. We find people in the world who have no religion, or at least not members of the Catholic Church, who will fast for physical reasons. But above all, it is beneficial spiritually because there's nothing we want more than food and sleep to satisfy those basic needs of our body, of the human existence, for nourishment, for rest. And when we deny ourselves in these areas, it is a wonderful penance, very pleasing to Almighty God and very beneficial to us. So let us especially commit ourselves at the beginning of Lent to observing the laws of the church, and if you are no longer bound to fast, you still could observe it if you are able, not eating between meals, eating things we don't like, passing over things we like, mortifying the palate, mortifying our sense of taste. 
So that is a very valuable penance, very pleasing to God. Now, why did our Lord permit the devil to tempt him? Of course, theologians tell us the reason why the devil tempted our Lord is because he didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was divine. Otherwise, he would not have dared to tempt him. He thought our Lord was a great prophet. But our Lord permitted himself to be tempted in order to encourage us in our temptations, to realize that with the grace of God, if we do our part and we pray and we make frequent use of the sacraments, and we mortify ourselves, and we avoid the occasions of sin, then we will always be able to conquer temptation. And let us remember that temptations are part of our life in this world, and there's no getting around them. In the Old Testament, we read in the book of Tobias, Because thou wast acceptable to God, it was necessary that temptation should prove thee. This was the archangel Raphael telling Tobias, who had been struck blind, why that had happened to him. Tobias, who was such a good and holy man. Because you were acceptable to God, it was necessary that temptation should prove you. And we find the same thing in the life of holy Job in the Old Testament, and of course in the lives of all the saints. In the book of Job, we read the life of man upon earth is a warfare. So we're going to have temptations. The importance is how do we deal with them, conquering them. And let us remember too that by temptation we are able to prove our love for God, to earn merit, to earn a place in heaven. In fact, St. Paul, speaking to the early Christians, says, my brethren, I'm sorry, this is St. James. My brethren, count it all joy when you shall fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience, and patience, patience hath a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, failing in nothing. Isn't that amazing that he says, count it all joy that you have temptation? Because there's our opportunity to prove our love for our divine Lord, to prove our loyalty to God by bearing with our temptations. To quote from the imitation of Christ that has a wonderful meditation on temptation, but I'll just give a few quotations from it. As long as we live in this world, we cannot be without tribulation and temptation. Hence it is written in Job, the life of man upon earth is a warfare, Therefore, ought everyone to be solicitous about his temptations and to watch in prayer, lest the devil, who never sleeps, but goeth around seeking whom he may devour, find room to deceive him. And notice the author here talks about being watchful. This is from the words of our Lord to his apostles in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Watchfulness or vigilance. We have to be vigilant. We have to be on our guard. We have to be aware that we are tempted every day and that at any moment we could be hit with a very strong temptation. And so we are on our guard against it and ready to turn to our Blessed Mother in prayer. No man is so perfect and holy as not to have sometimes temptations. And we cannot be holy without them. It's impossible. There's no place on the earth you can escape to. There's no unique country or village or retired home in the, up in the mountains that you can flee to and you'll be completely free from temptation because we carry ourselves with us. And we have a fallen human nature. And the spiritual writers tell us, and in fact it is in Scripture, that our threefold enemies, that is, the three sources of temptation, are the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've heard that often before. Let's briefly go through them, beginning with the devil. And let us never underestimate the hatred, 
that Satan has for us and the desire he has to bring us down, to cause us to lose our souls. In his envy, since he has lost heaven, he doesn't want anyone else to get to heaven. And so he hates us and desires nothing more than our downfall. So the devil tempts us like he tempted our Lord. But we also have temptations from the world. And by that we mean the spirit of the world which belongs to the devil. Our Lord said that Satan is the prince of this world. And when we speak about the spirit of the world, we are talking about those things that draw us away from God. The spirit of the world is one of vanity, of pride and rebellion, of impurity and immodesty, and of all sin. Young people especially feel that tug, that pull of the world. They're very concerned about how they appear, how they are dressed, what do people think of me? And we have to be very careful of human respect that we don't fail to do the right thing because others might look down on us or do the wrong thing in order to be acceptable to the world. How many have lost their souls because they wanted to be accepted? They wanted to be part of the group. They wanted to go along even when it was a matter of sin. So that's what we mean by the spirit of the world. And we all know what it is. We have all experienced that pull from this spirit which is opposed to our Lord. And finally, we have temptations that come from ourselves, from our own fallen human nature. Because of original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, we have that wound, that deep wound in our human nature. We have what theologians call concupiscence, which is nothing more nor less than an inclination to evil. It has an attraction to us. And so we have to fight. We, we experience that struggle between the spirit and the flesh, between our mind enlightened by God's grace, our reason, and our rebellious appetites, our fallen human nature. So the world, the flesh, and the devil, the three sources of temptation. And that is why even if we escape from the world, we still have the devil and our fallen human nature. So the solution then is not just to run away. The solution is to become stronger than our enemies. And we strengthen ourselves by the sacraments, by a good prayer life, by penance. By doing penance during Lent, we become stronger against temptation. The author of The Imitation goes on, Yet temptations are often very profitable to a man, although they be troublesome and grievous. For in them, a man is humbled, purified, and instructed. So think about that. When we are tempted, we're humbled. Our pride is brought low. We realize that we are weak and we are utterly dependent upon God and his help. And we cannot be self-sufficient and think that we can handle it ourselves. If we think that, we will surely fall. So in temptations, we are humbled. We are purified by bearing that temptation, conquering it. We gain merit. And again, we are purified, and he says we are instructed. Humbled, purified, and instructed. He who only declines them outwardly and does not pluck out the root will profit little. Nay, temptations will sooner return to him. And he will find himself in a worse condition. By degrees and by patience, with long suffering, you will, by God's grace, better overcome them than by harshness and your own importunity. And the author goes on to mention, I'm skipping a lot of this, he mentions one point that is very important. We must be watchful, especially in the beginning of temptation. Because then the enemy is easier overcome if he is not suffered to come in at all at the door of the soul, but is kept out and resisted at his first knock. Whence a certain man said, withstand the beginning after remedies come too late. Much easier to conquer a temptation as soon as we perceive it, as soon as we are aware that we are being tempted, than to allow it to fester, to remain. And the longer it remains in our mind, 
the more difficult it is to cast it off. So let us not toy with temptation. Let us not think ourselves so strong that we can allow it to remain and then we'll conquer it. But to vigorously get rid of the temptation at once. Slam the door in the devil's face when he first tries to put his foot in the door. Don't allow him even a crack to enter the soul. So let us take courage from our Lord who allowed himself to be tempted in order to help us understand that temptation is part of everyone's life and it is a means of earning the place in heaven that God has destined for us. We can't completely avoid them, but we can conquer them with God's help and our own efforts. And let us, especially this season, resolve today to persevere throughout the 40 days of Lent in imitation of our dear Lord, who fasted so vigorously for us, and to do some penance out of love for him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.